All right, guys. Well, here we are. It is one in the morning, and I have a really, really busy week coming up, but I want to stick to my word and really make up for the fucked up month that we've had. I want to give you guys like a solid ass last week, a couple videos a day. Um, this week coming up is super busy. Today, I was on the phone with Joe. We ended up talking to this woman that I've wanted to be in like a senior position of the Paul Project for a long time. She has experience with it. She's run needle exchange programs. And we had that conference call and I feel like we're going to be able to pull the nonprofit off now. I'm giving it to Joe and her. I'm like, all right, you guys do this. I, my schedule's way too gnarly right now, but I'll be the founder. Um, I got the seed money together to make it happen. I still feel really good about that and I can help them be an ambassador, do whatever I have to do, impart a vision on it. But basically they're making it happen right now. So that's one good, really good piece of news because that's really important to me. And it has been for a long time. It's just like my schedule's so, so bad. I do not mean to be as disorganized as I am. Uh, I piss off everyone in my life because I'm, I'm really clutter brained. Um, but that's one less thing I have to worry about. Tomorrow, I have to go meet up with one of the financiers of the doc, who's a fucking gnarly guy. So <laughs> the director, the new director, I, I was like, okay, I need X amount of money to finish the film. I need 30 grand to finish. He's like, dude, I have somebody that'll do it. He's kind of crazy. He's done 10 years in prison. I'm like, well, I mean, what do you do? I, I've been to prison. I don't judge people for that. He's like, he killed somebody that he had a, a, a film deal go bad on. I was like, huh? He's like, I'm just fucking with you. No, it's for weed. But it was like super awkward. I was like, huh? Like, I had like PT, I like winced. I took a pepper shaker and just like put some on my hand and put it in my eye. And I was like, oh, just so I could feel like I got maced for comfort. That's where I'm at. So we end up going to this guy's house. <laughs> Dude. I'm going, like, like I'm here, I'm, like, putting on a collared shirt. I'm like, do I look too formal or should I go a little more casual to Karina? She's like, I don't know, babe. I think you look good either way. So I end up going pretty casual. I'm wearing long pants, which I, I always wear shorts. That's like my, I wear boots and shorts and, like, a wife beater. Lately, I haven't been doing that because I'm too fat, but usually did that. Now I'm doing t-shirts. But I end up going very casually. I show up there. I have, like, an iPad with a PowerPoint presentation. I have one of my penthouses for him to give him as a gift. This guy has, like, two thugs with him. Like, goons. Henchmen. I was like, what the fuck? This exists in real life? I swear to God, it was like being in a movie. He brings me into this huge studio, big ass fucking house, like this huge, 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 it looks like an airplane hangar or something, it was crazy. And his henchmen are like super intimidating, one of them has like a marble eye, I swear, I'm like not exaggerating at all. Like, I'm like, I like wanted to pinch the eye out and be like, come on man, I'm trying to sell that shit on eBay. It was a crazy, I had like a spider fucking design in it. No, I don't know. But yeah, he really did have like a marble eye or like a glass eye. It was so weird. And he's like, all right, <sighs> pitch. I'm like, well, it's a paradoxical tale about, he's like, shut the fuck up. Let's just talk numbers. I'm like, okay, numbers I can do. I like explain to him how the investment works. I'm like, okay. So how it's going to work. You put money in. I give you X amount of points for the money that you put in. We sell the documentary or we license it. There's two different pools of profit. You get your principal back first. So you're protected with your principal. You get that back before anything. And then you get the net or gross profit, no matter what, depending on what kind of finance deal we have worked out after. 
So you get your principal plus you get a percentage of the documentary. And he looks at his goons. He's like, does it sound good? He's like, I don't know, boss. Ask him if he, uh, ask him if he jet skis. I swear, and I swear to God they asked me that. And I happen to know about jet skiing because I've done a lot of it. I was a drug dealer. So we started talking about that. The guy owns a yacht. This guy's a millionaire. Straight up millionaire. Cash millionaire. Did 10 years in the feds for weed and now he's like bawling out of control. Yeah, he's all into like selling boats and shit. Like he sells yachts. It's like what he does for a living. This guy's just... I mean, I, I'm around ballers sometimes, but this guy was just ridiculous. I ended up getting the deal. I had to give him a contract. He signed it. And I have to go there tomorrow to get cash. He's like, I'll just give you a briefcase. I'm like, dude, this sounds so fucking scary. I'm going to do it though. Fuck it. Because I don't care. I just want the money. No, I need it for the documentary. He said, it's like, whatever. But. He, t he called me today and he was all wasted. He's like, do you know who I am? Do you realize who I am? I was like, no, I met you once. He's like, ah. And he goes, why don't you want to see a documentary about you? Why are you so special? And I was like, I'm not special. I don't know. I have good footage. He's like, what about me? Why don't you want to do a documentary about me? I was like, dude, can I come over and get the money or not? He's like, yeah, I'll see you tomorrow. All right, bye, man. It was so weird. I, I'm like, it's funny because a lot of times I'll put a spin on shit like that and I'll say that I'm joking. I'm being serious. This is exactly how this was happening. It was out of control. So I have to go do that tomorrow. I'm going to have cash. And then I have to, like, go deposit in the bank so that I can pay various people, the editor, the director, to pay people that are... Producing fee, all sorts of crazy shit. Legal fees. I, you know. So anyway, that's tomorrow. Then on Wednesday, I'm going on the Dopey podcast. I know some of you listen to that. I'm going to be going on that with Dave. And then on Thursday, Brett Easton Ellis. That's the big day. And my dad got the vaccine. He gets optimized on Thursday as well. So it's a big day for my family. And yeah, it's a, it's going to be a busy week. But I definitely want to make up for lackluster content. And I, I know that I can. You, you got to, like, understand, like, my week is is going to be so crazy that today, I, that's what I had to do. Trina put it all on me. She's like, we got to do this, 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 and this. Her dick stinks. She doesn't say, I got to stop saying it. I know I killed that a while ago. I feel, and I feel bad about it. I was watching the Albuquerque video, the first one, the Vegas one, and I was like, I really liked it. I'm full of myself, but I, I think I did a good job on it. It's okay to be proud, right? I didn't look good. I had like a frohawk, I had like a trickle chin, I like farted multiple times, but like you, you couldn't hear it, but like you can see it in my eyes, I'm like, you know. Anyway, uh, okay, and then this sucks. I got a call today from somebody that I know, um, and he's one of the characters in the story that we've been doing, the one about the guy that tried to rape Jenny. Um, one of my, one of our friends that we grew up with watches Patreon. Pretty sure $20 tier, I'm not sure, um, but they told him that I was talking about that. And he's pissed off about it. Which sucks. I've never had that happen in a story before. Um, where somebody is like, I don't want you talking about that. I tried to explain to him, like, I did not use your name, though. So, you know, but it sucks because you guys don't know what happens next. But we did some... I, I can see why he wouldn't want that out there. You know, it's pretty severe, and it's the kind of thing that I think we could still get in trouble for. I mean, the guy didn't die or anything, but um, he asked me not to do that story and to take the other ones down, um, which I don't want to do. I don't want people telling me what to do with my content. I don't really know what to do with that situation. I already thought about it, and I thought because the story dealt with Jenny 
who was my ex-girlfriend who I loved, an attempted rape that had happened with her. I, I don't know necessarily if that's the kind of thing that should be on YouTube. Like, I think it's the kind of thing that's better for a smaller audience. There's certain stuff like that. Like the sex file stuff I've been doing, I don't want that on YouTube. Uh, God, my neck has just been horrible. Uh, so I don't know what I'm going to do with that, but we have to put that on pause. And it sucks because, like, I was building that up and I was, like, just about at, like, the point where that story gets really fucking crazy. But um, I'm pretty sure I'm, st I, I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing with it, but I'll tell you something by tomorrow about that. But out of respect for him, he is a person that I like a lot. We've been friends for a long ass time. I want to just pump the brakes on that for a second. So we're going to go into, I was trying to think of what story, there's so many stories that I can do right now that I think people would be happy about because there's stuff I haven't done for a while and people have been asking for them. I want to continue this base one because the base storylines are always the ones that like get me going, they like get me in the zone. And yeah, I'm already 11 minutes into it, but I'll timestamp it. Um, and I'll give you guys like a full hour story if I can. And if I don't, I no, no, you bitch. If this ever makes it on YouTube, like, comment, subscribe, check out patreon.com slash Ryan Leone. I really don't think this series will. I think I want to keep this exclusive for Patreon, but, you know, in case I'm, like, getting evicted or something and I have to, like, pawn my fucking Patreon stories, then, well, do all the things I just asked. All right, so we're going to get into uh, the Shaky Jake, the return of Shaky Jake, go more in-depth into some of this stuff. So... And it's, this is, and because this is the storyline that's the easiest for me right now, that's just what I'm doing. And we'll do another one after this for one of the upper tiers. <clears throat> but, uh, I don't know what I'm going to do yet, but I'll surprise you guys. So, where we left off last time. So where did I start? Like around 12 minutes. I'll timestamp it at 12 minutes. So I have to go an hour and 12 minutes. Jesus Christ. So, where we had left off last time, I was just running out of heroin there. And you gotta remember, this is my first time ever being in a serious institution like this. I may joke about the feds, and I know there's a lot of things that are funny that happen while I was in there, but the truth of the matter is I was really scared to be there. My attorney was telling me that I was going to get 10 years. Um, you know, I call my girlfriend and she's telling me that a guy that was basically involved with part of our revenue at ecosystem tried to rape her. So I'm feeling helpless. She's strung out out there. This guy, Happy, that was living with us started shooting heroin. He got totally unreliable. And I'm running out of dope in there. So remember, the first day that I was in there, they gave me 10 milligrams of methadone. The second day, they gave me... Or the first day, they gave me 20, then 10, then 5. I had like 9 grams of heroin with me. And if you remember, I had... A bunch of pills. I had, like, random pills in, like, a shoebox at my house. You know, as as a drug dealer, I had just this, you know, people would always be like, dude, you want these? And they'd just give me handfuls of shit. And I'd be like, yeah, I'm going to try this. And I'd just throw it in the shoebox. So you'd open it, and it just looked like this crazy-ass pill collection. So when I knew that I was going to be turning myself in, I went into that pill collection, but I didn't know what I had. So it was a bunch of just, ra I'm like, all right, well, I'm going to go with the white ones because I'm a peckerwood. I just grabbed like as many white pills as possible. Now, I knew that some of them were methadose. And I think that people don't realize that there's a difference between methadone and methadose. It's not a big difference. Methadone is the brand name methadone. That's the actual chemical. That's what they give you in the juice at the labs. Um, or at the labs, yeah, 
You're gonna love today. That's what they give you at the methadone clinics. And it's also the wafers that they give you. Now, I have not seen those for a long, long time. When I used to live in Florida, they would have these little white wafer pills. They were amazing. They're 40 milligrams. If you didn't have a habit, they would get you fucking blissful. Like, I'm not trying to promote drugs, but those things were fucking amazing. I loved them. I've never seen them out here. And methadose were these little 10 milligram generic methadone pills, but they were called methadose. That's what, when you go to a doctor, even, I know some people, they're rich and famous, but they're on methadone right now. And they have doctors that still give them these, these little 10 milligram methadose. You never see those anymore. Like if you're a, mor if you're a, a mortal, you can't get that. You have to be somebody. You have to have, like, trading cards made after you, and then you can get them. It's really hard to get them, for, for real. So I had a bunch of those in the shoebox. And, of course, I knew that I was on, I was on 180 milligrams of methadone at the time. So I knew that I was going to just be going through it hardcore. So I started grabbing as many of the methadose pills as I could, but then there was also Xanax. Now, that's something that I never really, I don't think, went into too hard. <clears throat> um, when I was doing this, my five years in federal prison, the first time that I did that series, I don't think that I ever really properly explained that I was also addicted to Xanax at the time. And the reason being is, is because I was trying to do that big, like multi-million dollar outside grow operation. So I was having to smoke a lot of weed at the time. I'm not good with weed. I act stupid. I say stupid shit. I'm insecure. It'll be silent and I'll like look at someone. I'll be like, hey, do you like me? And like sometimes the people fuck with me and be like, nope. And I'll be like, oh. and I'll just like sink in my chair. Start taking lint out of my belly button. Try to inflict pain on myself. So what I started doing, and, and when you're around growers and you're around vendors and you're around all these people in the cannabis industry, you're smoking all the time. And if you don't smoke, you're a cop. It's like completely bad etiquette to be like around a bunch of big time growers and big weed people. They're all smoking a blunt. They're like, hey, you want some dog? And you're like, nah, I don't smoke. <laughs> They'll get people get straight up sketched out, straight up. Especially if, like they know that you're a druggie, or what? All of a sudden you're not smoking, so I'd be like, "Yeah, yeah, I'll blaze it. Come here, let me get that." I'm, like doing tricks. There's like horn squiggles coming out of my nose. I'm like, "Yeah, it's badass, huh?" And then all of a sudden I'd like get in that scared state where I'd be like. Is anybody hungry? And then my internal thought would be like, I wonder if the way I said it sounded cool. I don't think so. And then I'd like just completely go catatonic and I wouldn't talk anymore. Every time. Invariably, that's what marijuana did to me. And so it was, you know, kind of a paradox where I had to smoke so they didn't think that I was a cop. But it would make me so insecure that it would, like, paralyze me. Like, sometimes I would, like, get in my mind and I'd be like, all right, you're really stoned right now. If somebody says something, you don't answer them. And they'd be like, all right, well, what you trying to pay for this, bro? And I'd just look at them and give them, like, some scared stuck look that doesn't work either because then they you know my friends would be like hey man you know i talked to my homeboy and i don't know he said that you're you're weirding him out he's like asking you questions and you were just looking at him not talking fucking embarrassing me dog i'm like uh so i was always in this bullshit this is honest to god what was going on so i found that like i had crazy ass dog i was making 10 grand a week back then. I had a bunch of money. I had doctors that would give me anything that I want. I'd be like, 
can you get a handgun? He's like, of course. Writes me a script for a fucking Glock. I'm like, all right, cool. No, but I could get any pill I wanted. So I started getting on Xanax. Now the problem, and I've never been good on Xanax, ever. Like, wake up with, like, some Navy guy's arm around me. And I was, like, cufflinks. I'm like, oh, my God, Jesus. Some businessman, <laughs> you know, like, see these cufflinks. I'm like, ugh. But the thing about Xanax is that those effects of you blacking out dissipate over time. It's not as severe. After, uh, like, a while, I could take Xanax, and it didn't make me black out. It didn't do anything. It's like any drug. You do it, like, that's what Kratom does to me now. It does nothing. But I'm addicted to it. Gee, look at that, dude. This thing was fucking, like, full. It's, like, gone. Like, this will be gone tomorrow. It was 26 bucks. And this is a shitty kind. I'm mad at myself. I cannot believe I'm a new thing like that. It's ridiculous, dude. Kratom? Fuck. May as well start doing rhyming poetry with my buddies. Like, dude, I did a new rhyme today. What about you? Yeah, of course. Two or three of them. When we come over, we're cited to each other high and create them. Like, that's what I'm that's what I'm on now. So So what happened is the Xanax tolerance just built up. So this was my habit at that point. I'm doing 11 grams of heroin a day. That is not an exaggeration. I put that on everything. I swear to God, that's what I was doing. 11 grams a day of good heroin, not of like some bull, like people are like, that's not possible. It is possible if you're on 180 milligrams of methadone, if you have what seems like an endless supply of heroin, you can do that much. Trust me, I was doing it. And it got to a point where I couldn't even do a shot in a normal syringe. I had to, like, use, like, fucking um, steroid syringes. I was like... It was to the point where junkies would come over and be like, Dude, come on, let me get your cot. And I'd give it to them, and they'd fucking drop dead on me. I'd be like, uh... I'd have to, like, revive them. Just off my cotton rinses. It was insane. So my habit was gargantuan. 11 grams of heroin, 180 milligrams of methadone, and 7 Xanax bars a day. With withdrawal, the worst thing you can kick is methadone. There's nothing that even comes close. It's like sex compared to thumb wrestling. Thumb wrestling is any other kind of, like, withdrawal. And sex is, is it's like butt-fucking compared to thumb wrestling. Seriously. Butt-fucking is the methadone. But Xanax is no punk either, because ben, when you kick benzos, you have seizures, you hallucinate. Heroin's horrible in itself. Um, it's just, when you do all, when, the, when it's a confluence of all of them, it's all bad. So, you gotta understand, like, the emotional state that I'm in is very fragile at that time. I'm freaking out about all this stuff. And I got this Paisicelli. My sister come. She bring Chiva. I promise you trust me. Then we run out. Right? So the whole time I'm like, all right. Because that's how it is when you're a drug addict. You're optimistic because it's easier to be. You're like, you're like, well... The guy that only started speaking English when he found out I had a big sack of drugs I smuggled in says that he's getting heroin this weekend. It's probably true. And I really thought that in my mind. So Saturday comes, and it's like, coincidentally, right as we run out of the heroin. Oh, in the pills. I was going into that. So I had these methadose pills. I had Xanax crushed up. I had Seroquel crushed up. All white pills. Plus shit that I probably didn't even know what it was experimental like Chinese research chemicals that are used to like sedate people that cartel members or human trafficking I'm like yeah, I'm gonna snort this fuck it so we're like at the end of the sack we run out of heroin but we still have this powder and we're just like we're just like and we're both like just sucking on our fingers we're like doing it together I'm like you do it too we're like doing it's very weird to do that in front of you guys 
But then I would stick it in the powder and I'd suck on it again. He'd do the same thing. We would like trade. He'd be like, come on, suck on mine. I'll suck on yours. And, that was, and then we ran out. So we'd run out of powder. I'm mentally preparing to do 10 years in federal prison. And on top of that, this place is scary as fuck. One of the first fights that I saw when I was in there was, I think, on... So that Saturday comes. I'm like, so... What time's your sister going to be here, amigo? He's like, two o'clock, maybe three. All right, cool. We do the last of it at, like, noon. I start panicking immediately because there's a psychological terror that goes into kicking like i wasn't feeling withdrawal yet but you're like man wait a second do i feel sick i might maybe i do a little bit oh fuck i am sick but you're not yet it's the same thing on the other side of that when you take a placebo drug you ever do that like you're like burning somebody and you're like yeah this is acid man uh, I'll eat some with you, fuck it. And you eat it, and they're like, dude, I think I feel it. <sighs> this is pretty intense. And you, like, know that you just gave him a piece of paper out of your pocket. And you're like, really? What are you seeing? He's like, I don't know. Naked girls, because I like them, because I'm not gay. I'm like, <laughs> you know, and you're like, okay. Right. Um, <laughs> sorry. That's really lame when you make yourself laugh like that. So... So I'm in a state of panic, right? And I didn't know what time it was. I had to leave the cell to go look at a clock. I think I did have a watch, though. But for, I don't know, for some reason, maybe I was going out to check, like, to see if visits had been called. And I am walk outside of the cell. I remember this very clearly. I walk out of the cell, and there's this black dude with dreadlocks. Now, this guy was a piece of shit, okay? He deserved what the fuck happened to him. Probably the second day that I was there, he comes up to me. Gold grill. I think he's like a southern black dude. He's like from Louisiana. And he's like, comes up and he's very nice to me. He's like, hi, I'm Barry. And I was like, hey, Barry. And I was like, God, you don't look like a Barry. He's like, the dreadlocks and the grill, huh? Nah, I'm just like you, man. I'm from Santa Barbara. My parents own a healthcare company. I'm like, damn, really? He's like, yeah. He's like a total con man. <laughs> you know? Seriously, I swear. He's like, come to my cell with me. Come on. I was like, God, yeah, all right. Sure. I'm feeling social. Let's go. I end up going with this guy to the cell. He's like, hey, man, you hungry? Hold on. Let me put this blanket on the ground so that you can sit Indian style and we can chat. I'll even make you some coffee. You like coffee, right? I'm like, of course I do. I thought that this, I was like, dude, this is my boy right here. I, fuck, I would die for this fool. I only knew him for like three or four minutes. I, died, I like felt a connection already. And then he's like, Payday or Snickers. And I was like, let's go with the payday. He's like, I almost, I, so it's like I knew you were going to say that. Pulls one out. And he's like, all right, you can have that. You need, you, do you need any more stuff? Now, I already had a bunch of commissary down in my cell. You know what I mean? Like, I didn't need shit from this guy. But he had all this crazy ass candy in his locker. I was like, let me get one of the, let me get those Reese's. Let me get, damn, are those, are those blow pops? Is that at the Indian shooting the star? Let me get that. You know, he had all that stuff. So he gave me this, like this fat stack of candy. He's like, let me wrap that up for you. And he put it in like a, like a piece of a sheet. So I had this like fat sack of candy. He's like, look, bro. 
I gotta go now. And I'm like sitting Indian style, like holding my like little coffee cup. I'm like, what do you mean? I gotta go, but look. So everything I gave you, I gave you 46 items. I'm gonna need 110 back, okay? That's just what the standard, that's the standard transaction tax. I was like, you're three for wanting me, dude? Barry, he's like, Ryan. I'm sorry, no refunds, bro. So he straight up hustled me. I was like, what the fuck? So I'm like leaving this black guy to sell this big ass sack of candy. It looked like I just sold my asshole for it or something. All the skinheads, like, what the fuck? You're allowed to go into other races, sell but like that. But anyway, it did not look good. I'm telling you, it did not look good. So that, so that was like the second day. Maybe like, the, yeah, it was like the second day. I'd already sold a bunch of shit because cash put me on blast. And, uh, and so I just go back down to my cell and I just have this sack of shit that I don't need because this guy like hustled me. And of course it wasn't exactly like I was saying, but he acted much nicer than he was. That's you know pretty much what it was. So I go out of my cell to figure out, I think about the visits or to look to see what time it was. And that guy that had tried to hustle me with the dreadlocks is on a, on one of the pay phones. Now there's a row of pay phone. This is how this place looked. It's like a horseshoe shape of cells. So it like goes in a U. It's double tiered. So there's like, you know, stairs. It kind of looks like the show Oz or like, you know, in locked up shows, you'll see places that look like this, the very classic prison model, 270 or whatever it's called. And then there's a desk at the bottom where a cop sits at all times. That's where the guard sits. And then there's a row of computer or a row of phones on the wall. And then there's also behind that, like, a row of um, computers and you can go like do your core links email and then there's like this little outdoor recreation area so I see the black dude Barry whatever his name was let's call him Barry sitting on the phone probably yelling at some you know white chick that he's extorting or whatever he's doing <laughs> and um, and I see this this other black dude come up go up to, and this other black guy like I don't know he's like tall and lanky the, the guy with the dreadlocks was kind of chubby, I guess, a little bit, like kind of, I don't know, kind of like goofy physique, you know, the kind of, he had, kind of had like a corny look. And this like tall, lanky black guy just comes up to him and grabs his dreadlocks and just goes, bam, and fucking hits him against the, the wall. And as soon as he hits this, and like, he, the guy didn't see it coming. He's like on the phone. He's like, yeah, come on, ugly slut. I'm going to release all those photos I took of you sucking on, you know, whatever he was telling her. And this guy just goes up to him, grabs his dreadlocks, and just hits him against the wall. Now, he hit him so hard that, like, it literally made, like, a streak of blood on the wall. And I'm sitting, it was barbaric. I was like, oh. I looked at the white guy, I was like, Does, uh, do I still need to pay that guy if he gets beat up? They're like. And this guy does not fight back, right? Like, I think he was either a pussy or he was so stunned that it happened that he just didn't defend himself. So this tall, lanky guy just starts kicking him in the face and shit. This guy's, like, curled up in a ball. When he hit him the first time, like I said, it, like, streaked blood on the wall. And I remember looking at him, I was like, oh, my... Like, I've been in county jail a bunch. I was in Florida. There was a lot of brutal fights. But this, like, had, like, a prison intensity to it. Like, he, like, grabbed those dreadlocks like it was tetherball and was like, ah! And it, like, looked like he, like, cracked his head against this white wall. And the cop, lazy, gets up and he's like, hey, gentlemen, knock it off. <sighs> you guys, d and this tall, lanky dude's, like, stomping on his fucking face. Everybody's kind of like, come out of like you know people some people are sitting at tables some people are up at cells people are are looking at it cop is doing nothing he's just letting it happen and the dude that i knew was curled up in a ball didn't fight back he did not even throw one punch back 
this tall lanky guy just keeps stomping on his face. He's wearing, and they're both wearing like flip flops, you know, these like federal issued, I don't even know what to call it, Crocs. They look like Crocs. And like everybody's wearing like orange socks. It just looks ridiculous. It looks like, I don't know, homosexuals in like a retirement home. That are like eccentric. They're like, dude, let's wear Crocs with orange socks. This looks gay and old. You know, it's like that kind of thing. So, eventually, since this guy just keeps stomping on him, the guy just hits the deuces on his on his walkie-talkie. It's the first time I'd ever seen that. He's like, all right, I'm hitting the deuces. I'm gonna hit. I'm gonna hit. My, I'm gonna hit him, and he hits it. Maybe like ten seconds later, cops just come swarming in. And they cuff both of them. I was like, both of them? I was almost going to be like, hey, excuse me, sir. Hey, the guy with the dreads didn't do anything. That other guy assaulted him. But I knew better. I didn't do that. <laughs> so, uh, God, I'm like I'm laughing at all my own shit tonight. Um, so they both got cuffed. And what was really memorable about that, and that, was the fir that was the first fight I'd seen in the feds. What was really memorable about that is the guy with the dreadlocks that had tried to like three for one me on sweets had these huge knots in his in his forehead and he had dreadlocks and these dreadlocks were like mashed like it looked like a uh, pancake syrup and he was just he looked he was like crying I was like damn and this like white dude's like look at him that one there's a bitch. Never liked that bitch. Uh, he's like sipping his coffee. He's like, ooh, man. Fucking made it way too hot. What are you doing? You good? All right. And he like left. I was like, this, this must be like something that happens pretty frequently. And it was. That was like the first little incident that I'd seen. So, of course, <laughs> this guy, my celly sister never comes to visit him that day. And he starts like regressing in English. Now remember, when I first met him, this guy didn't speak English at all. He was kicking heroin, like shivering in his bunk. And I was like, hey man. And he'd be like, hola. Coma. You know, just saying like generic Spanish responses. And I was like, hey, I've got heroin in here. He's like, hey man. You think I can get some? You know, he'd like all of a sudden just could speak English. It was super tacky. And now that we were out of drugs, I was like, hey, dude, it's four o'clock. It's three o'clock. It was like, it was like th around three o'clock now. That's why I was outside. That's how I saw the fight to begin with. And uh, I was like, they're not calling any more visits. I don't know if your sister's coming. Do you think you should call him? He's like, no, I'm tired. Then he just like resorted to like strictly Spanish. I was like, dude. Don't tell me that you tricked me, man. That's some bullshit. That's some puto shit, bro. And he just, like, rolls over. It sounds like a log, like, rolling, like, down a fucking hill. It, like, creaks. Like, it's like some ancient fart. Fucking piece of shit, dude. He, like, tricked me into breaking bread with him with what I had. So now the panic, it, like, I know, now I know there's not dope coming. Like, my optimism was, like, this big huge grandiose bubble I had, it was like wearing an astronaut helmet of optimism and it just got pop and i was like <gasps> i was like airless because my i you know what <laughs> this metaphor going way too hard so i started getting really scared at that point i was like oh my god i'm gonna die you know because i knew that i was gonna be kicking the benzos, I was going to be kicking the heroin, now I was going to be kicking the methadone, I was really scared about that. The thing about benzos is they have a long ass half-life, so it takes a while for that withdrawal to really kick in, and I don't know how much of it I had in the white powder, so I don't think I was kicking the benzos at that point, I think that what I was feeling was just the heroin, that 11 grams, I started getting really sick, I, you know, um, first thing is that your nose starts running that's how you know that it's starting and you're just like fuck 
and like snot like goes down your fingers. You're like, I'm hit. I'm dope sick. Your friends are like, so? Me too. You know, some people handle it better than others. Jeff always said that I was the biggest baby he's ever met when I'm sick. But I started getting really scared, you know? So my nose is running. I start getting these hot and cold flashes. And my skin feels like it's crawling. Now, that's one of the things that I hate the most about kicking heroin is it feels like you have saran wrap as skin and it's just super uncomfortable and you can give yourself like Indian rug burns and shit with your skin if you know what I'm talking about. You have this indecisive body temperature. So like one second you're really hot and then one second you're really cold but you're shivering the whole time. So sometimes those shivers are, are like heat flashes and sometimes they're like icy cold droplets going on the back of your neck on like a freezing cold day and you have restless leg syndrome so your leg feels like it's no longer made from bone it feels like it's some sort of like super pliable rubbery you know um i don't know it, your legs feel rubbery so all these things start kicking and that's not even bad that's nothing I didn't have nausea yet. I didn't have diarrhea. I just had the skin crawling. I had the indecisive temperature, runny nose, panic, and a bad headache. And I was just like, oh my God. Now I knew that I, there was not like, it was one of those moments where I was like, I don't know, reality just hit me. You know, it's like, what am I going to do? And this big old obese dude. Hispanic guy, kind of looked like Mario from Super Mario Brothers, but super heavy. Comes up to me, he's like, hey, brother, how you doing? You know, fat pieces always kind of talk like white people for some reason. Hey, man, how you doing? Uh, I forget what his name is. We'll call him Mario. How are you? I was like, not too good, bro. He's like, what's wrong? I was like, Dude, I'm coming off a lot of drugs right now, and I'm tripping. It's just starting. He's like, I understand. I understand. Listen, I used to be the same. I used to be on every drug known to man. But something, something made me feel better above anything. I was like, what? He's like, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. I was like... Yeah, Jesus is cool. But cool? <laughs> Jesus is the best. He sits I swear, This guy had a fucking pocket Bible in the, his back pocket, and he pulls it out. Nothing against Christianity. I have nothing against any religion, for that matter. In fact, I'm, some of the best people I know are religious. But I am not. And the last thing that I want to hear about when I'm kicking heroin, methadone, and Xanax is that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. I was like, I don't want to, I don't, I don't, please don't fucking do this right now. He's on one knee and he's like reading me like, you know, Psalms and shit. And I'm like, oh my Jesus Christ, dude, Jesus Christ. He's like, it's exactly what you need to be saying, brother. And I was like, oh my God. So he's on like one knee. It looks like he's proposing to me. Just imagine this fat looking Mario guy. Like, and I'm like sitting, I'm like, shit, I'm like, oh, I'm so sick. I'm mad at myself. I'm pissed off. Mario's like, you know what? You're going to come to prayer circle. Yeah, you're coming to prayer circle. Right after count, man. Right after count, they're going to feed. They're going to do chow. We'll eat. We all meet here. All of us. Some of the toughest convicts in here do prayer circle. We got little Bobby over there. He was like this little Millhouse looking dude. He looked like Millhouse from The Simpsons. He's like, I was like, fuck, this is, this, this cannot be my crew. This cannot, like, if a riot pops off, these guys are for sure going to get killed by their own people first. And they'll be like, oops, it was an accident. I didn't mean to slaughter the dude that looked like Millhouse. I didn't mean to kill the annoying guy that preaches Jesus all the time. It's not what I wanted to hear. 
you know, and like, I don't want to offend anybody, but it's like, you know, I've been in jail for three days. I'm with people that have been in there for like five or six months. And now they're, all of a sudden they're going to tell me like what I need to be doing with my life. It's like, motherfucker, you're in the same situation as me. I'm sorry. But like, that's cool that you found God, but I'm kicking and that's not going to help me right now. But you can't tell people like that anything. So I was like, yeah, dude, I'll go to prayer circle with you. Nice to meet you, Marty. He's like, yeah. You too, brother. Amen. I was like, yeah, amen. Fuck. You know, I was like, man, I got to avoid that guy. So I end up, they're like, all right, everybody get in your cell. Four o'clock stand up count, which I would get so used to because they do it at every jail and prison in the country right at four o'clock. They come and they lock the door. It doesn't matter where you are, federal or state prison, you're doing a four o'clock stand up count. It's awkward because now I had to go back into my cell with the, my Pisces celly that had been lying to me. But I was way too, I couldn't do anything. I couldn't beat him. I was already starting to kick really bad. And a lot of it may have been psychological. That's what really tripped me out about the Kratom was that I didn't know that I was kicking anything. So I just felt what made me tell Karina that or like come up with the hypothesis that it might be Kratom was when I was like you know babe it's weird I've had like I felt like I had a fever but I didn't have a fever the only thing that could be that is like kicking and she's like are you on heroin again I was like no no I'm not on heroin I was like oh my god when did I stop taking Kratom and she told me And we ended up going to the head shop and buying some. I took it about an hour later. I was well. I was like, are you serious? And that's how I figured it out, though, because I felt fluish without a fever. I was having her take my temperature. I didn't have one, but I felt like I did. And that is one of the things with, with um, when you're in withdrawal. So you feel like you have a fever even when you don't. So we do. One thing that I had going for me is that first night that I was in there, Cash had all these people bring commissary to me. One thing that I insisted on was a radio. I'm one of those people, I listen to music all day, every day. Even out here, I listen to me. Sometimes that's one of the things that really holds me up from doing story videos. It's like, I'll just be listening to like Fleetwood Mac or something. No, I don't listen to shit like that. But, you know, I'll just get like stuck listening to music. But anyway, let's get... Let's stay on course. So I'm listening to music on the radio because someone had given it to me. And that was like my saving grace. Like it, it helps so much, so much. I don't want to sound too corny, but when you're in a setting like that and when life is that gloomy and an old song that you really like from like the 90s comes out, you're listening to like Santeria by Sublime or you know, an old Nirvana song or even shit that you don't like. You're like singing along to Smash Mouth and shit. You're like, I am an old star. <laughs> this is so cool. This is nostalgic. You even like stuff you don't like. Chumbawamba. I would like sing. I'd get so stoked when shit like that would come on because it would remind me of being like 12. So I'm sitting in my, and of course, you know, I have the top bunk because the Pice is older. So he's like shivering completely dope sick now it was nice you know for a couple days i was able to get him loaded and get him well and now he's back to kicking now he doesn't know english anymore that's fucking convenient right so we have to do a stand-up count and the cops knock on the door da, 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 da. come on lights on stand-up count but paisa like looks like you know it's immigration like his eyes are just huge he's probably having flashbacks and shit he's like I'm like, dude, they're not going to do it. You're already in here, bro. He's like, oh. And he, like, stands up and, like, puts his hands up. I'm like, dude, you look like we're doing something wrong. Stop doing that. So we just stand there. And they leave. And that's all, you know, you have to turn the lights on and stand up. That's all you have to do. And you have to stand in the middle of the cell. Remember, I used to have cellies in, like, Wisconsin. And we'd, like, hold hands. <laughs> the guards would, like, walk by and we'd be holding hands. 
and like wave with one hand and they just thought that was the funniest shit ever. A lot of the guards liked me because we would joke with them like that. So after stand-up count, I'm really starting to feel sick. Like I haven't thrown up. I haven't shit yet. Yet. I'm about to. They open the door after count. And I go to chow. Now, federal prison, you're on a national menu. You know exactly what, I know, I could tell you what somebody's eating in federal prison right now. What day is it? It is Monday. They are having uh, sausage and gravy for breakfast. Who cares? You guys are like, who gives a fuck? I don't know. It's But it's the same shit. And one thing that you eat a lot in there is chicken. And it's like tainted chicken. It's like shit that they probably find in a sewer somewhere. I don't know what chickens are doing in there, but I'm sure they exist. And that's what they feed you in prison because they don't give a fuck about you. And for some reason, this chicken smells awful. And when you're kicking, that's one of the worst parts as well is that you get this amplified sense of smell. Prisons always stink. Remember I, I tried to describe it when I was doing one of the Boston videos or one of the, I don't know what it was, but I was describing how prison smelled. And I said, if you open a pumpkin, if you take your shit in it, you got to come in it a couple times, take off a dirty sock, put it in there. Now put the lid of the pumpkin back on. Like a week later, just open it and smell it big old whiff of it that's what jail smells like that's what jail smells like that's what prison smells like it, it, if you're not kicking when you're kicking it's almost you almost get it's almost like like huffing you know it's like it's literally like that bad odor turns into like fumes you just like start wobbling and when you smell that chicken you can smell the rancidness of it like you can it's it does not smell like a chicken there's like pices missing from like certain units you like see one of their faces on your tray you're like wait a second is that is that tiny tiny <laughs> or whatever i don't know what pices names are uh traviaso or you know whatever the fuck their names are um, Flaco, you know, shit like that. There's people that have that theory that they kill Pisces. Like, they're like, all right, we're sending them back to immigration. I swear to God, we're not going to serve them to you guys. And you're eating it. You're like, dude, this is not, like, because you eat stuff in there and you're like, this, <laughs> I'll be honest with you, bro, this tastes like a person. I'm going to eat it anyway because I'm fucking hungry. And I've spent all of my money on drugs, but pretty sure it's Paisa. Your friends are like, I don't give a fuck, man. Come on. Pass the condiments, <laughs> you know? And uh, so I'm at dinner. I'm smelling this rank-ass chicken. And I'm probably thinking stuff like that. I'm like, it looks like human flesh. I, like, touch it. Says, like, one word in Spanish. Whatever the case was, I could smell the rankness, and I, I ended up throwing up. In the chat room. Not in the, I mean, in the day room. That's where they serve us our dinner. And I'm sitting with the whites, and I'm, like, eating, and I just am, like, Bleh! I cannot even help myself. And the guys are like, hey, man. Oh, come on, man. That's fucking disrespect. I'm like, dude, I didn't do that on purpose. He's like, you know what? I don't like your attitude. I don't like people that throw up. That's my thing. My dad used to do that. He used to throw up at the fucking table. You know You know what? You know what I did to him? You know what? You want to know what I did to my dad? I cut his dick off with an ice skate, put it in his mouth for everything that he did to my little sister. That's what. Bitch. And like walked away. I was like, oh my God. And you really are around people that are rough like that. And there's a, there's this common theme of people that are, have gotten abused. <clears throat> and it's sad, you know? It's like, 
I'm not saying I'm like the smartest guy in the world, but I'm smart enough to understand like that most of like 99.9% .9 of people in prison come from broken homes. I'm the only one that like had like a solid family. Once in a while, I would like come across someone that had like parents that were, you know, didn't abuse them or whatever. I felt like I was like meeting like a fellow survivor of like some super rare plane crash or something. It was weird. But I threw up and people got pissed off at me. Come on, man. <sighs> Disrespectful is all fuck. God damn. Fucking animal. I'm not seeing you and the guy with the, the black guy with the dreadlocks fucking sell. Doing some gay shit. That's fucking gross, bro. I don't like you anymore because you don't have any more drugs. I'm gone. So I had to go get a mop out of the mop closet. I'm, I'm like, you get muscle aches when you're kicking. You get fatigue. You get to the point where everything feels like an overexertion of energy. And then you're dealing with the thing where you have farts on deck that potentially can splatter spaghetti looking shit. So you're like, you're super alert. You're like mopping and you have like one hand cupping your asshole. And I'm not joking at all. Again, chunky optimism. You're like, if I accidentally shit my pants, I'll just put my hand on my asshole and hopefully I can push it back in. That's not going to work when it's liquid like that, but you think that it will. So I remember like, cleaning this vomit up with this mop and I was like it was it was horrid it sucked and all of a sudden I felt like I had a puke again now this is like after I've been like trying to clean it for like 15 minutes there's still people eating at the tables while I'm doing this and I'm trying so hard not to and there's like a trash can in the corner and I run up to it and I miss. I end up puking on the floor again. It was twice that I puked on the floor, twice that I puked in front of guys that were eating. So I was already off to a very unpopular start in this unit. And you got to remember, 18th Street was indicted. The Mongol Biker Outlaw Biker Club was indicted at that time. My Mendoza cartel case, the Avenues, the Hawaiian Gardens. There was a bunch of different Southsider gangs, the cartel, and then the bikers. There was like no white guys. There was a handful. and They, they didn't like me from the get-go. Everybody's just giving me a bad look. I'm like, fuck, man, this sucks. You know, on top of everything that's going on physically, I have to worry that I might get stabbed. I, I, the same thing that might happen to me that happened to Barry with the dreadlocks some kids his head against the wall and there, his blood was still there that blood was there for like six months too it was like felt like it was the bloody handprint on the volleyball and castaway the wilson wall but it was just this scam artist black dude with dreadlocks blood it was the same concept though get all lonely and i talk to the wall i did see that that blood there for a long, long time. And I, I had moved units, but I was able to see it again. But anyway, I remember I came back, but we'll get to that a little later. Uh, so like after I finally clean up my puke, I hear Leo. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm getting bail. Fuck, please. Leo, you got mail. I was kind of happy to get mail. I was like, all right, cool. And I get it. It's from somebody that was basically in that circle of Molly drug dealers. I was like, what? Like, I didn't have anything from my parents, nothing from Jenny. I had something from, like, a random person from that group of people. So I go to my cell, and I read it, and it's this, like, straight-up hate letter. And it was like... I was like, hi, Ryan, this is so-and-so. It was somebody I knew's girlfriend that was, like, in that group of people that sold Molly. She's like, I just wanted you to know that so-and-so's dead. Her boyfriend died. So I'm, like, reading. I'm, like, already sick. I just puked. I'm scared of getting hurt. And now I'm reading about how somebody I know's dead. And I'm just like, I, but I have no feeling, you know? Like, try to rip a tooth out just so that I could, like, fiend, like, tears or something. 
She's like, he's dead. He overdosed two nights ago. So this happened like right as I went in. And she's like, and you know what? I blame you. You came and you polluted this entire scene with your heroin. You're a shitty person. So I just want you to sit in there in your own shit. And I want you to sulk. And I want you to think that this guy is dead. And she like put all these like pictures of him with his family. She's like, this is your fault. It was like written in crayon. It was like boyfriend killer. I was like, like cash came in. He's like, what's that? You get a little, oh, let me see your flicks, man. What'd you get? Boyfriend killer. What the fuck, man? I was like, I don't, I don't, it's, it was a misunderstanding. He's like, all right, it's cool. My baby mom is like that too. So uh, anyway, you don't have anything, do you? No, cash, I don't. All right. And he just left. I'm like, fuck. And I have this letter and these pictures. And it was crazy. It was like this whole scathing letter about how it was my fault her boyfriend died. Her boyfriend, incidentally, had been a heroin addict longer than I'd been alive. Her boyfriend was like 50. And he was into like straight up like crazy weird bondage sex. So like, yeah. I like getting fucked in the ass with a dildo. Who doesn't? If you don't do that, you're queer. You know what I'm saying? It's like, no, I don't know what you're saying. He's like, it makes me feel alive, bro. When you get to be older, all you want to do is feel alive, bro. And now she's trying to tell me that I'm responsible for that guy dying. I'm like, dude, this motherfucker had gauge earrings. I'm not responsible for anybody's death that has that shit. But honestly, like, I'm joking about it, but it made me feel really bad because she was talking about a lot of different people in whose lives that she said that I had ruined. And this was, like, the first letter I got while I was in there. And it was true. I'd gone in and I had polluted that scene. You know, that before I got there, everybody was, like, having a good time. People were like, yeah, I'm going to learn a new hobby. Maybe I'm going to, you know, I don't know. Maybe I'm going to take a knot tying class just because. And then, like, once I moved in, people were, like, pawning amplifiers and shit. It was horrible. And it was all my fault. And I felt that. I'm sitting in the cell just sulking in that shit. So I, I'm, like, crumple the letter up, rip up the picture she sent of her boyfriend. I, like, take one more look. It's, like, him, like, when he's, like, nine, like, sitting on the Easter Bunny's lap. I'm like, oh, I, that's cool. I killed that guy. Great. Like, ripped it up. Went to go throw it out. I'm walking back to the cell. And I hear, hey. Hey, man. And I look. He's like, it's your Jesus friend. Mario. I don't know if what his name. His name might have been Mario. He had, like, one of those weird, like, Wario-like mustaches that are like reserved for like artistic pedophiles and shit like not anybody i would hang out with that's for fucking sure people that have like those crazy like dolly uh mustaches scare me you know i'm probably i'm sure they scare you too he's you like you're not trying to get out of prayer circle are you i'm like you know Honestly, man, I'm, I'm not feeling too well. He's like, that's, that's crap. All right, that's crap. You told me earlier that you were going to accept Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior into your life. Okay? We're on Jesus' time, not on your time. What's your name? What's your name? What is it? John or something? It's like, John, what's that supposed to mean? It's like, nothing, man. Come on, we're going to the prayer circle. So we... We go to this prayer circle, it's like the most, and I'm like, did not want to do it. This guy was being super aggressive with me. Like, Jesus, man, I felt like I was getting spiritually butt-fucked or something. All of these guys in this prayer circle were the biggest dweebs there. Like, there were guys that, like, I'd never even seen. They were, like, all pasty. They just kind of, like, slither out of the cell for prayer circle because they were probably chomos you know a bunch of weird ass people so we're like holding hands he's like all right we're gonna hold hands and 
So I'm holding hands with these guys. And skinheads are walking by. They're like, what a fag. And I was like, me? They're like, yo. I was like, god damn it, dude. I'm holding these dudes' hands. Millhouse is like, dude, your hand is so sweaty. It feels like somebody's nervous. I was like, what are you in prison for, dude? He's like robbing banks with notes with my brother. And then spending it on religious shit. I was like, oh, okay, I swear, not an exaggeration. That is really who I was holding hands with. And I was like, this is, this is great. So the dude starts doing his little sermon or whatever, however you say it. And he's, you know, it's like one of those super obnoxious ones where he sounds like thunder. He's like, and God struck down the mighty. And I'm just like, really? Really this? this like, this is, <laughs> thanks God. I'm, thanks for this. Thank you for this right here. Thank you. He's just saying all this crazy shit. And then all of a sudden he's like, Yeah, I let my uncle suck my dick when I was a kid. So what? I swear, I was like, what the fuck? Like, what kind of prayer circle is this? And he's like, and against all odds, I beat it. Lord be with you. And they're all like screaming. It was. I felt like I was in some like ritualistic predator circle or something it was really creepy like all of these guys had I, like my chodar was like burr, 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 burr. i was like dude and then like it was that was over i was like god thank god i'm like walking away he's like whoa 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 not so fast we're doing bible study now we've got workbooks i'm like you're doing bible studies dude i've done enough going back to my cell he's like tell us one of your stories about getting abused i was like dude i don't have any and secondly if i did i would not be doing it in a fucking circle you guys are all weirdos it's not the kind of thing that you do in a prayer circle man he's like have you ever done a prayer circle i was like no but i don't know if i was like imagining one that this shit would certainly not be part of it. Fuck, I'm out of here. They were all mad at me. They're like, you're not, you're not invited back. We're Christians that judge people. I was like, yeah, I, I, I checks out. I'm out of here. So I ended up going back into my cell. Now, by this point, I'd thrown up twice in front of people while they were eating. I'd gone into a prayer circle with, and I pissed off the chomos of the unit. I was not too upset about that. I was like, all right, I don't want these guys to like me anyway. And my celly is sitting in there just shaking, saying random shit in Spanish. I don't even know if he was speaking Spanish. It was like some other like la uh, Latino, it was like Puerto Rican, or I don't even know what the fuck he was speaking. It was some weird ass shit. I felt like I was in a Will Smith music video or something. But he's like saying weird stuff to himself, and I just go up on the bed, and I'm just that's when it really like when I got up on my bunk and laid there, that's when I really felt how sick I was for the first time, you know. I'm covered in sweat. The hot and cold flashes are getting so intense that I feel like, and it feels like you're, I'm getting tortured. You know, I'm like, feel this like violent flutter of bipolar temperatures, like surging and coursing through my blood. It felt horrible. It felt like icicles that were like on fire were like in my veins and like going all throughout me. And I remember right there, I thought about Jenny. I thought about my parents. I thought, you know, my parents were old then. That was fucking 2009. That was like 
12 years ago. And I was thinking, man, I might do 10 years. I might never see him again. And I remember just crying. Sniffling. And the dude starts kicking the fucking frame. That's what you do when, like, someone's snoring. He didn't say anything. He just starts kicking the top bunk so I'll stop crying. Piece of shit. I'm like, let me cry. My life sucks. And you all know what's going to happen next. You know, I, <laughs> I just start going into the worst withdrawal of my life. And we'll get into that uh, in the next installment of Shaky Jake, The Return of Shaky Jake. I'm sorry that I couldn't finish the David storyline right now. I'd like to, but I also got to respect people's wishes. But we'll figure out a way to get that in without, you know, I don't know. I got to talk to him. I'm going to talk to him tomorrow. Um, I'm tired right now. I'm going to try to get another. I'm going to do another video. I'm not going to try. I'm going to do another video right now. And this series is definitely going to pick up, but we have to go over some of this stuff before we get to like newer stuff. Cause I don't want to be like, well, remember like, you know, I don't want to have to switch around. It's just going to be a panoramic view of my first five years in federal prison, but like go much more in depth about it. Uh, so after this, there's a lot of newer stuff that I haven't talked about before. Anyway. I appreciate you guys. I'm tired. I'm delirious. I am trying, though. All right, I have to go. Pull up, bro.